Hi, welcome to July's meeting of the Scarlet Quill Society here at Yeah Right. I am Rowan, and I'm so excited to be able to bring to you this international panel of experts to talk about sensitivity reading. Um, what's a sensitivity reader? Who needs one? Why do you need one? Um, and what's it like working with one? And where did they come to this work as people um, and, and as editors? Because, you know, it's an editing series, guys. So uh, I think I'm supposed to do the like and subscribe spiel at this point. Y'all have heard it. You can imagine it. Um, the other thing that I am supposed to do right now is um, acknowledge that Yeah Right or the majority of the people who make up Yeah Right are at this moment uh, sitting here in the in the middle of the summer on the unceded land of the Multnomah, Wasco, Cowlitz, Kathlamet, Clackamas, the Bands of Chinook, the Tualatin, the Kalapuya, and the Malala tribes. And in acknowledgement of their contribution to our area and of the fact that we didn't ask them if we could be here, uh, Yarrite has made a donation to the Naya Family Center, the North American, North American Youth Association Family Center um, in uh, Portland, Oregon, uh, which provides culturally specific programs and services that guide people in the direction of personal success and balance through cultural empowerment. They provide a continuum of lifetime services that creates a wraparound holistically healthy environment that's youth centered, family driven and elder guided. And with my land out of the way, um, I would like to ask our panelists to go ahead and introduce themselves. I am going to go around my screen clockwise. Um, I don't know if everybody else's screen is the same way, but it means that Asha is um, on the spot to, to introduce herself. Okay, Kaya, I'm uh, speaking to you today from Wajuk Nungabuja, which is in Perth, Western Australia. This is land that was never ceded and it always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Um, I acknowledge the country that I'm speaking from and I pay respect to the elders of this land and of all the nations within what we now call Australia. And good morning, everyone. <laughs> morning, it's nine o'clock in the middle of winter there. I'm so jealous. It is so warm <laughs> here. You'll notice that I'm in a t-shirt, poor Christine's in a tank top, cats, tank top. Uh, <laughs> Shannon, are you good to go next? I'm good. Hi, I'm Shannon. I'm from Seattle. Um, I've been a writer for a long time. I don't know if I have anything else to say. Fantastic. I'm gonna actually unmute Kat, probably. I think I'm <laughs> successfully unmuted. Hi, um, I'm everywhere online as KT Okopnik, as you see on the bottom of the screen. Um, I these days am not revealing my location, so I'm not going to talk about which specific tribal lands that I sit on, especially because I'm in a part of the country that has um, apparently no current living tribal lands. There are tribal people living in all over this area. Um, I don't know the accuracy of that, but it's a thing I do need to look at. Uh, I acknowledge that I'm living as a settler colonialist invited by the invasion and not by the uh, traditional inhabitants of Turtle Island. So, uh, my pronouns are Shile, and we'll get to the rest of things as we go through the panel, I think. All right, let me make sure that I've got all of my windows up so that I can see if anybody has questions. And Let's jump right in. I am, uh, as I said when we were talking earlier before the panel started, I'm not going to explicitly discuss anybody's marginalizations, location, whatever here. Whatever y'all are comfortable revealing about yourselves is great, um, and, and we can move forward with that, but I'm not going to bring anything up, or I'm going to do my best not to bring anything up, and I'm sorry if I if I slip, because I've known all of you for, for a few years now. Um, so what I want to talk about first is the question that um, 
I think all of you are going to agree should be question three. So I just want to front that. Um, but the question one that everybody asks is, how do I find a sensitivity reader? Where, where would I even look for a sensitivity reader? I'm writing this book. I have a character that I'm really enthusiastic about, or I have a, a it's set in a country that I've never lived in. Where, where do I find my sensitivity reader? That's a very good question. Um, if editor, they're usually the best to. You're breaking up just a little bit. Can you say that again? Editor, they're usually the best place to go to first. Am I still breaking up? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this is wild. We did such a good sound check. <laughs> I'm going to jump in while Asha's, I think, um, dealing with her sound. The thing I've started telling people, I used to have a different answer to this question. After years of doing sensitivity reads, I started asking people, if you don't know anybody from that community to do a sensitivity read for you, do you actually know enough about that community to be writing about it? Yeah. Yeah, and I hear it a lot in the context of science fiction, like, oh, well, it's not really the Japanese American community that I'm writing about. It's, you know, I really, really love anime and I really love, you know, the trappings of this culture or I, it's not really, it's Wakanda, it's not Africa. And and they they come at it with this, okay, I think I can isolate these pieces that I want. So it doesn't matter if I know somebody from the culture. That yeah, would be that a, a really legit answer if only the people who are living amongst your readership who are represented by that marginalization or that characterization weren't affected by those depictions. Mm -hmm. It would have been really nice throughout my childhood if I could say, oh, that's not me, that's those Asian people over there. That's actual Japanese people in Japan. That's not the way it works for those of us living with those marginalizations. When people write an, a stereotype or problematic portrayal of a certain visibly or performatively marginalized, uh, identifiable marginalized group, this is, this is a thing that has impact, even if you think as the writer that you've demarcated clearly enough. Yeah, I'm just so. gonna piggyback on onto what Kat says and say that uh, this is something that I've come across before where people have uh, consulted with um, particular, in my case, Indians living in India about issues um, that may be acceptable there, but are problematic for people like me who are not living in India, who have lived outside of that region, who are living in colonial states and having to deal with all of the pushback that results right. from the video. So right, that, like I mean, the, the source lander question, right? Like right. what's what's okay when you're living at home and you're not experiencing, you know, a, a diasporan identity. Exactly. Exactly. And I think yeah, I think there's a big difference too. A lot of people don't tend to realize that when you're presenting something in media that outside of you know your country of origin or your idea of your core readership that is going to be what other people are seeing and i think a lot of people don't really think about that they don't think about their crappy ideas then becoming the template for other people's idea of other people's actual real lived lives i think people like to pretend like that's not real but you know 200 years of social sciences aren't wrong yeah. So this, this transitions kind of uh, naturally into, into a question that one of our participants asked, which is, so obviously like there are sensitivity readers and sensitivity readers, and they're going to have different cultural competencies, not just based on what is their country of origin, what is their family's country of origin, but it based on what are they experiencing right now and where are they? So how do you know when you're picking the wrong sensitivity reader? If somebody says, oh yeah, you know, I can, I can sensitivity read that for you. I am a, you know, I'm a disabled woman living in 
uh, Minneapolis. Um, I have I have competencies with disability. I'm fine to sensitivity read for this disabled character that you've got, but the disabled character that they've got is not a woman in Minneapolis. Okay, well, I mean, that's there's your answer. It's you have to ask the right questions. It does your sensitivity reader have all the same marginalizations? Do they share marginalizations, all of them, with your character? Uh, if not, you're going to struggle. And uh, it's also going to be a case of not the, not relying on one sensitivity reader alone. You may need to consult more than one. So when you've constructed your conservative nightmare character who is all the tick boxes all at once, mm -hmm. um, it is tempting if you are not yourself living all the tick boxes all at once to imagine that these things are all sort of assembled in a line. And the thing I say when I'm talking about defining terms of social justice is that Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw, when she coined the term intersectionality for discussing the experience of black women as being distinct from black men and white women has a specific framework. I've expanded on it in the year since for the convenience of con conversing about this to say that there's three elements to an intersectional identity, which is talking about multiple marginalizations, which is that they are um, intertwined, inseparable and intensifying. And so when you live all those things at the same time, they are very different than if you live them all differently and separately. So if you as a writer say, I've got a black man and I've got, you know, I know about this because I'm a white woman, you're missing out on the experience that your character as a black woman, let's just say, for example, has. And you're engaging in an action that's called misogynoir, M-I-S-O-G-Y-N-O-Y-R. O-I-R, which yeah. is OIR, which is a portmanteau of misogyny and noir from the French. And this is a persistent problem. If your character is disabled and also racially marginalized, they're going to experience your disability in a way that cannot be separated from the racial marginalization. You need to go look for this. The internet is a big place. There are 8 billion people in the world. I promise you somebody knows about this. Whether they are willing to be your sensitivity reader or not, I don't know. But the further away you are from that marginalization, the more you're going to be making mistakes because you're going to be writing from other people's stereotypes or other people's things who are written for a gaze that was outside of that. You want to look for hashtags like own voices because you want to get as close in as possible. But even an own voices narrative is very much in danger of being shaped by the gatekeepers who said, oh, could you tone it down a little bit? That that seems really hard. Let's not make it so awful and all these other things. So, you know, Do they have to talk like terms, that? Knowing the yes. terms like inspiration porn, knowing the terms about trying to decide that all the people who are like X are all going to behave the same way. These are all problems that you're going to be tempted to engage in and and it's superficial characterization you don't want to do that but you want to know why you made the character what what you did right so have you guys as have y'all as sensitivity readers um come across a point like what do you do as a sensitivity reader when you're like oh well i share some marginalizations with this character but not all or this is this is something that i do have some tangential experience with that i'm being asked to read for like is it, do you bring someone else in? Do you give them a name? Do you, do you just yes. kind of let it slide? You, yeah. Yeah. All of those. I think for me that there's been times where I've talked to people that I know or, you know, other people that I know who have done sensitivity reading because none of us knows everything. And right. regardless of how your marginal marginalizations intersect, there's going to be some part that you're not going to be great at either either being able to pick out as part of the problem or because maybe it's not a large part of your marginalization 
it's not a big part of your experience. And I think for me, I've tended people that I've worked with, I've given them a little bit of grace in that respect. I think that um, allowing people to kind of get to those places on their own and then see, okay, you got here. How did you get here? What were you thinking? And sometimes from that point, it's the point to say, you know what, I'm not the person for you, but I know this person or, mm. um, you know, I know this organization or I read these stories. I think it's really a person by person, interaction by interaction thing. Some people can get there without necessarily needing, you know, another person with that very specific intersection. Some people don't. I, I think it really just depends on how you work together and what the end goal is. And that it is a conversation. It's never just a, you know, straight up, here's the advice, go away. It is always a conversation. So there's the there's the other question that I wanted to weave into this. What does the inter, inter, interaction look like? You know, somebody has found you, there's, there's a, something in their story that is, and, and I want to I want to put a pin in because this is something that that Kat and I have talked about before specifically about when you bring your sensitivity reader in. But what does the interaction with you look like once you're in? Like, do they hand you the story and get back a bunch of comments and that's it? They have to make their changes. Is there a lot of back and forth? Do you do verbal conversations? What what does that look like and, and why? And is it personal to you and how do you like to work? That was I think a lot of questions, sorry. That's a lot of questions, but I think it's a combination of all of the above. It, it, is, it is a personal thing. It does vary from sensitivity reader to sensitivity reader. It also varies from client to client. So uh, depending on how comfortable you are with your client, Frank. that conversation can change. So, yeah. you know, it, uh, yeah, if you're going to find, if, if you have a client who is, uh, very resistant to your comments or your suggestions, then chances are you're unlikely to have a face-to-face -face conversation with them. You're much more likely to have uh, uh, an email exchange or some such. Because it's a lot. What, what, what we do as yeah. sensitivity readers is already a lot. And then having to confront someone who is resistant to that is more on top of that. It adds stress, it adds tension. It, it's a lot for us to bear. Yeah, and that's something that came up with all of you when we were doing the, the interviews for the post was don't be fragile, don't be fragile. What does that look like? Because I think we tell people don't be fragile a lot of the time, but what if, if you have an example like floating to the top of your head, great. Uh, if you don't or you're not comfortable talking about it, obviously. I have don't. one. I got all one right. for you. Um, uh, in the heyday of Yahoo email groups, if you've been on the internet yes. a long time, you know. Um, I was in a writer's group and uh, it was one of the earliest times someone asked me to be a sensitivity reader. Nobody was using that phrase at the time, but the author said, okay, well, you're black. This story has black people in it. <laughs> read this. And I read, I read his story. It was a cis white man and it was not good. Uh, he apparently had spent a couple of afternoons maybe watching old episodes of Yo! MTV Raps or something. And two paragraphs in, I sent him a note and I said, okay, this is not going to work. Like, that's not, Yeah. please don't. And basically, he sent me about seven emails in about two hours. All of them were about a thousand words apiece about why... <laughs> he was being authentic to the black experience and how I should be more mindful of the fact that not all black people talk like me because obviously I'm very special and you know I don't know what other black people sound like that's what I'm <laughs> talking about I think that by fragility it's that instantaneous idea that this because you no know, if you're not experiencing the marginalization no matter who you are you're going to have that moment where you're like how dare you? How dare you say that I don't know what I'm talking about? And it's the people who can't get past that moment to actually do what we're here to do. Like, if you can't, I, I fully appreciate that people have the moment. You're human. You can have it. But it's when people get stuck 
in that idea, like, how dare you? How dare you? You know, I'm not, and get very worked up. And that's the point where I personally will disengage with people. If you can't get past that moment, we cannot work together. We probably can't even be friends. I have taken to explaining to people that if you don't treat your sensitivity reader as an expert, you are performing a societal pattern where you are in a position of entitlement over people because of the, you don't actually have personal in your own body experience with. Because people will say, well, I lived in that community. And what I often say is, if you are a mystery writer and you bring in a gun expert, you are not going to argue with your gun expert when your gun expert says, that's not how the gun works. But, and you're not going to be fragile about it because you're gonna go, well, I brought in a gun expert because I don't know how guns work. It is entirely okay for people who are living in their own lives to not be in 100%, 10%, whatever percent aware of how other people live. But to say, well, I have a, a child who, I have a friend who, I grew up in a community who is, this is one of the ways that fragility works. There are actual giant lists out there where people of marginalization have listed all the things they're tired of hearing people say. This is a good thing to go look up before you go hire a sensitivity reader. Go look up what all the stereotypical problems are. Go, I say this a lot, um, have a safety line, have a timer, figure out how to get out. But TV Tropes is your friend. TV Tropes wants you to know exactly how boring and overused the stereotype is. It is going to tell you, this happens all the time. This is the low effort characterization. This is a problematic thing to do. Don't do it. You can have a sensitivity reader tell you those things, but honestly, your best use of a sensitivity reader is to catch the little subtle things that you wouldn't have known. Right. So we're, you know, it's 2022. Are, we are expecting people to catch the big things themselves, ideally. Um, but uh, I, 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 I will say years. I have dropped a couple of giant balls. Um, a couple of y'all have seen me do it. Um, <laughs> thank you. That was a very diplomatic face. <laughs> um uh and and because i did have a good team i was able to not make those mistakes but um but how how do you at, suggest that a writer interrogate that like is it a good idea for them to look i got back to our question sit down with somebody before they start writing are, is it a good idea to sit down in the idea phase before you get attached to stuff? When, or do you like, do you want to wait for the whole thing to be done? What if it's only a thousand words? <laughs> sit down with someone early, sit down with someone often, talk it through. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you've got access to sensitivity readers um, early, do it early because it will give you a good idea of whether your concept is going to fly or not. How does a consultation like that work, though? Like, is it like I buy you a coffee and we talk through this? It's depending on your relationship with the person, right? Yeah, it does very much depend on your relationship with the person. But yeah, it, it could be something as simple as a coffee with someone and a chat. It could be something much more formal. In this age of I, Zoom, I, I send you a Grubhub gift certificate for dinner. <laughs> I think that a coffee is underpaying your sensitivity reader. I think that, you know, and I acknowledge that not everybody can afford this. Honestly, I think that you should be paying $20 or something equivalent to that for a 15 minute consult for, hey, I had this idea. Can you give me a thumbs up or thumbs down on it? And I, honestly, if you I can't do that in 15 minutes. I was gonna do a blitz. Yeah. If you can't get your story down to an elevator pitch, you're not gonna get it past a, a, a publisher or an agent uh -huh. anyway. Yeah. And the other thing I think sometimes people miss is that they don't look to their own community. Um, it's 2022. We have, there are 9 million ways to connect with other people currently. And I think that if you have this idea, which is something that happens to me quite frequently as a writer, 
it will have these ideas and some of them are real whacked out. And there are times when I just have to ask a friend, is this a bad idea? Because I think that if you're not to the point where you're ready for a sensitivity reader, sometimes you really just got to ask the question. There are many books that I've read. There are many that I've reviewed. There are some that I've worked on that immediately I said, this was a bad idea. Why didn't someone be a friend to this person? It's not even necessarily a, you know, not someone that you're hiring as your expert to begin with, but someone who likes you enough and respects your work enough to say, hey, don't do that. Don't. Writing and groups I, are really good for that. Sorry, mm -hmm. Shannon. <laughs> no, you're right, though. You're right. It's true. Like, you got it. Sometimes you just got to say, okay, look, I think this might be a bad idea. Can someone please tell me if I should do this or not? And if a bunch of people say, hey, no, maybe it's just time to let it go. So one of the questions that somebody asked is, are there generalists, like big issue spotters who can tell you what kind of sensitivity reader you need? And my gut right there is like, that is your writer's group. That is your editor. Your editor should be telling you, you need to bring someone in because I'm not competent to read this. But Kat? if your writer's group is not diverse enough, you need right. to start right there. You need to start mm -hmm. right there because the vast majority of people in writing groups right now are in writing groups of people who are like them. Yeah. And mm -hmm. the other thing that's happening right now is that writers of color and disabled writers and queer writers are getting bounced out of these homogenous affinity writing groups because they speak up as a member of the writing group to say, hey, um, and then they get cold shouldered, sneered at and chased out. And I have dozens of these stories over the years. Dozens. And those are just the people who told me personally. Dozens. And yeah. so Dozens. It, it, Same. I've watched it happen so many welcoming, times. If your group is not welcoming the kind of writers who can be your front line, immediate early feedback, you are writers grouping wrong. And you are just inviting the internet to fall on your head eventually. Because you're getting uh -huh. homogenous feedback early mm -hmm. on that's not helping you write better stories or feedback from people who can emotionally brace against <laughs> that specific hostility from your homogenous group you're getting a heat proof frog yeah. problem asha what did you want to say i'm just going to add to that that the corollary of that is that you end up with one or two um, folks in a writer's group who have particular marginalizations who are overwhelmed because they are continuously seeing the same tropes repeated over and over and over again. So don't wear your, your whole diverse group out. Don't wear your one person in your group out. Yeah. Um, that happens. Twitter, Twitter <laughs> as of today, I, I'm not going to guarantee Twitter as of tomorrow. <laughs> Twitter as of today is a wealth of viewpoints on these things. Yes. You can lurk on all sorts of places on Twitter and on Facebook and learn. And there are lots of communities that are still open for you to read where you can see what activists and concerned people in those communities care about and what they complain about. Really, the generalist should be you as the writer. Mm -hmm. yeah. Ideally, yeah. And especially because like, if you are a non-marginalized writer writing about um, Let's see if we can get Shannon back. I think their email or their internet may have cut out. Seattle's being a little weird right now. Um, if, where was I going with this? Oh, look, can I just add oh, on to you're not the, making you're not making new mistakes. You're making the same mistakes that other people have made. Let the other people make the mistakes for you. Look at the mistake and then don't make it. Yeah. I'm just going to add on to what Kat said about Twitter as well, is that, um, look, it is one of the best platforms for you to silently follow a diverse group of, uh, in, in this case, writers or uh, activists or people speaking about marginalisation. You can learn so much by just diversifying who you follow. Right. Make new mistakes. I would be delighted to see new mistakes. 
sensitivity reviews would be so much less burnt out if we saw new mistakes. Yeah. It is agonizing to pick the same mistakes over and over again, especially yeah. when you sometimes have one client who keeps coming back to you because they love you. And you <laughs> oh. know, you develop friendships and all these other things, and then they did it again and again and again, and you're just it's really heart wrenching to tell a friend. Um, yeah. So we've talked a lot about what a sensitivity reader does for you. Um, what what your responsibilities are to your sensitivity reader, um, or, or what your sensitivity reader's responsibilities are to you. What they're going to catch for you. How they're going to handle stuff what are your responsibilities as a writer like what do you as a sensitivity reader wish that writers would do for you besides stop replicating the same mistakes that you've seen a thousand times from other people and possibly from them like what what would be great if if you had your dream client who you know obviously is still making mistakes because we're all human we all make mistakes we all want to write things that push the boundaries of of interest and and all of this but um what what would be exciting research people that have researched beforehand mm -hmm. for real like i worked with someone last year on a short story and she came prepared she had um looked at various resources she told me the things that she was doing beforehand to make sure that she had this thing that she wanted to get through in her story correct and uh, in this case, it had to do with Afro-diasporic religions. Um, and I, I was very blown away in her case. And there was a nonfiction article that I worked on as well. The research, if you're prepared with understanding where you might have gone wrong, that is fantastic. That gives me a lot of faith in someone when they say, okay, I wrote this thing and I hope that this is okay please tell me if it's not that's do you feel like that. they come to that as less resistant yes yeah yes, yes so because of the particular marginalizations that i write about i i find that sometimes people who've done the research end up being fragile in the other direction because they're like well i did the research and my research says this is okay and it's mm -hmm. like, you need to know what gaze that research was written for because a lot that's of times right when it comes to especially things like diasporic religions, um, tribal practices, and sociocultural things, a lot of the things that were written, even recently, are written for a particular gaze that yeah. exoticizes these various things. And you may end up replicating these things if you come from a place of research. But at least know what the research says. And then understand that you're hearing from one person who is professionally of offering an opinion, but yes, we're not a monolith, but also just because you can find one person who says it's okay, doesn't mean it's gonna be okay for everybody. I cannot provide you a Teflon shield. Somebody else may say, oh my goodness, why did you do this thing? And you're gonna come back to me and say, why did you let me do this? I'm like, that person has a different opinion because if you are writing from non-marginalized people you know that people vary a lot non-marginalized people get to be individuals marginalized people need to be individuals as well the thing that i would like to see writers doing with the sensitivity readers is to be really clear about how you'd like to have your feedback do you want the spontaneous notes that came up while your sensitivity reader was reading and the marginalia or do you want a polished document with an analysis and a couple things pulled out. Do you want to have a lot of hand holding? Are you saying, hey, I have rejection sensitive dysphoria, I need you to be, you know, really gentle with me? Because if that's the case, then that's a thing that needs to be negotiated so that there's consent on both sides. Because maybe there's a different sensitivity reader who's willing to do a different approach in how they offer feedback. Because being told suddenly, well, I have you know, this is out of the other, and I can't believe you talk, spoke to me like this. It's the most, I, I, at that point, I don't even know what to say. And I have left projects saying, hi, I think we're um, a bad fit. 
I wish you all the luck in the world. Um, I'm going to remove myself from the project. Please don't mention me going forward. And then, frankly, if somebody's been that kind of spectacularly fragile, I will not recommend them to other people that I know. On the other hand, there is also the case of just a genuine communication mm -hmm. misalignment. And in that case, I will say, hey, you know, this person that I didn't click, but I have a project for, you know, X many words, this kind of topic, does somebody want to pick it up? And there are little pools of people that I know who are willing to pick up these kinds of projects. So. Right. Yeah. It's like any subject matter expert, right? Like maybe you and your, your gun expert for your action movie, just like you're really having a hard time making a, a phone call work because you're in different time zones. There's, there's all kinds of reasons to not be a good fit. Don't make fragility be one of them, please, everybody. Um, Asha, did you have yeah. anything to add? Um. Yeah, look, I think we've covered most of the ground, uh, including making new mistakes. That would be delightful. Uh, <laughs> not being fragile would be particularly... Uh, you don't special. know me. You don't know all the things that I've done for you and, and your people and your community. That is right. Did you call me all racist? <laughs> number of times I've had people come and say, oh, but I've, I've lived in this community or I know a single person of this marginalization and therefore I know everything about it. Oh, please, no, please, just, you know. <laughs> as, as Kat said, allow us some individuality. The individuality you see around you in your community, we have in ours also, you know, in each of ours, in, under every intersection, we have... Okay. Also, if your sensitivity reader actually got really, really sensitized by what you wrote and snapped at you, you probably did something really terrible. And you should really look at it instead of going, oh my God, why did you yell at me? Because yeah. I mm -hmm. promise you that sensitivity readers, for the most part, do not go into the, the task expecting and wanting to yell at people. Right. They go in, have we go in cards. wanting to say... Most of us go in wanting to say, hey, this thing is gonna, that's not gonna fly well. We don't want to be yelling at you. We really don't. But there have been times that I was just like, <laughs> I, I know Taurus and I, I, I use this and it, it, it's happened more than once, but I saw an author write a description which was age, age, racialization, age, age for a group of people. And it was just like, uh, what? <laughs> what? Mm, and yeah. I'm just like, I don't know that I want to do any more close reading of this. Mm. That was just really interesting and spectacular. But I've seen it happen more than once. If you were only describing the characters of color, this mm -hmm. one is a freebie. If you were only describing characters of color for their racialization, everybody else is blonde, blue eyed, red head, green eyed tall, short, um, you're doing it wrong. I promise you, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> and and yep. you learn to do it by the things you're reading. This is not because you're a bad person. It's because you're modeling from what you're reading. It's the trope, Read right? Read something else. We absorb Read this, something else. we pass it on. We, you know. Yeah. It's also the assumption of a default, that the default is white. Yeah. That the default is straight, that the default is male, whatever, you know, it is... That assumption is tiresome to read. So I gotta tell you, I had an author who didn't describe characters and their comeback was, well, these characters, they were doing some problematic things and their comeback was, well, this character isn't white. So how dare you make that assumption? What? <laughs> and on the one hand, they're not technically wrong in that the character is not described as white, but on the other hand, they are in the U.S. writing in English. I have gotten the excuse, well, everybody sees themselves in, in yeah. the characters. And I'm like, no, marginalized people are used to not seeing ourselves in the characters unless we are specifically called out as like us. The other one that I've gotten is um, just the idea that 
you can just not describe anybody Mm -hmm. and that this is this is all just and it's like although i've seen him i've seen pieces written where the only the white people were described Mm -hmm. which is kind of fun that because in my childhood that is what would happen but yeah no so i was you know and and because it was old times and old people (laughs) the descriptions might not have been the most polite things but that that was all they were describing is when people were white so when somebody gets you for a sensitivity read and you give them information which is clearly high quality thank you for the freebies um how do you how do you get acknowledged how do you like to get acknowledged do you just say like i've been paid and this is good if it's like a book do you want a, a special thank you in the acknowledgments uh do you is is there a point where you're like you can you put my name out there because you're a respected organization and i'm i'm glad that i worked with you and this is some exposure for me or is there like a take my name off it like is there a point where you're just like please do not associate me with this project this is i can't i have tried to save your project and i can't and i'm going to take your money but you can't take my name yeah does does anybody have a Mm -hmm. titillating example that could be sufficiently anonymized that they'd like to share (laughs) i have Uh, one i have one um uh, many years ago, when I was still professionally writing adult material, um, a website hired me to look over some male submitted lesbian stories. Like there you. were some, there were some problems, um, and one of the authors at one point got so upset when I corrected him about anatomical realities that he went to the head editor and complained and complained and complained and finally the editor i sat down with the editor and i said i don't think i can be i can't i'm like i'll still do the work for you but please take my name off this website it was a very popular site at the time i did not want people seeing my name associated with this ridiculous thing that i had tried to you know that it, i tried to save you I, yeah. I tried i didn't I didn't want people to think that that man really thought that really thought, you know? And for me, there is a point where even if it's not necessarily the material, but if the author has been uh, particularly feisty about it or particularly fragile or, you know, everything has gone well, there was one case where it was just one little thing that they wanted to argue about that they got stuck on in the feedback. And I just said, that's just not very realistic. It's not how that works. And at that point, I said, okay, well, my sensitivity read is done. Our transaction is completed. I do not need to be acknowledged or mentioned. The work has been done. Good luck with your book. Right. Because at the end of the day, number one, you're not here to stop anybody from writing. You're here to, to make what they write better. Um, you might encourage them away from stories specific stories but it's not like don't write forever you as a human being are canceled it's it's more like this story is not your best self or anyone's um but like you can't stop them <laughs> i i gonna do a related it. story where a really really renowned much respected older writer denounced sensitivity readers from a a, um, a public platform that they had and me being me I stood up and I said no that's not right because their feeling was that and this is the thing we hear commonly that sensitivity readers are there to stop people from writing that we want everything to be dulled down softened edges nothing sharp nothing problematic nothing challenging that we just want it to basically be literary baby food mm-hmm. and what I said then and what I've said subsequently to every writer that I've worked with when we get to these points is, look, I want you to be courting the lightning that you intend to court. And that if you are doing something that is challenging and pushing at things, it's because you meant to do it. And there are going to be things that you decide that you mean to do that I do not want to co-sign. 
And at that point, I will take my, my name off the project and I will ask never to be mentioned in relationship with it. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people want to use a sensitivity reader as their shield. Yes. Say, oh, well, you know, I had it sensitivity read. And that's not the appropriate use of a sensitivity reader. Sensitivity reader is there to try to get you to make the choices that you make mindfully and with knowledge so that you're not suddenly out there on your book tour and having the internet fall in your head. We've watched authors get piled on. Mm -hmm. And and then they they resort to saying, well, hate is gonna hate. And it's like, well, yes, but there was a point in there. You did a thing. You 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 know, mammoth fail was a thing. You, know, you said that yeah. no native people existed. It it, it was a, a literary genocide. This is not okay. And so yeah. Is this something that you see more from writers who bring their sensitivity reader in late when they yeah. have their project essentially completed? Yeah. yeah, they're generally more fragile. At that the, point, you know, when you've gotten to that point in your project, you don't, no writer wants to change. Right, we all feel this as writers, right? You're emotionally attached to the character you envisioned, the way that it's written now. And it feels but, like a lot of work to change it. Exactly. But, so the later in the process that you're engaging oh. someone to look over your work, the more resistant you're likely to be to change anything. Mm -hmm. So and, yeah. off, and it doesn't get changed a lot. I think that um, there's been a few books in recent years that have hit mainstream lit world that were absolute yeah. crap bombs. And, you know, I saw a couple of these authors after the fact oh well you know i had so i had people look at it well it's too late now you're gonna yeah. get dragged people have been damaged by and i think that's another thing that people don't understand sometimes is that when you get to that point your project is done bring your sensitivity reader they like yikes and then you're once you're already at the point you know your first arc is too late um yeah. at your publishing party is too late <laughs> when you're getting dragged on twitter and people are showing photos of your centerpieces from your party oh that god are that... part of the problem you know what i'm talking about yeah i do um, all that was like part to me part of being a sensitivity reader for me especially with writers i really enjoy i don't want to see them go through that i don't want to see them drag contributing to dragging themselves that way and if you wait until you know you sent your last you went over your last edits it's off to your editor it's too late it's uh, game over. I, I got too late. asked for sensitivity read at a point where they said can you fix this so it doesn't change the page count and it won't affect the copy the layout <laughs> and i'm just like no, you want me to preserve it. That's, that's an ask. <laughs> In 537 that, characters, exactly. Curious? Can you make is, this a anybody is curious? That is way too late. <laughs> Even if the galley hasn't gone to the printer, that's still too late. <laughs> if you've already finalized the pagination, it is too late. <laughs> I no doubt. just was a gasp. And I was like, you have got to be kidding me. This is a joke, right? How, how did this go through so much review? It wasn't even a tiny press. And I'm just like, what, what, what? Right, that's that's the mystery. And, and I guess it's not really party, mystery, I don't but... remember the names because I do work very hard to forget. But, oh, wow, that was special. That was, you know, we've tried that we've brushed against this a couple of times um, while you guys were talking and we don't we don't have a whole lot of time left, but I, I want to touch on the fact that sensitivity readers are subject matter experts, but it's more than being a subject matter expert. It is essentially exposing yourself to potentially harmful product almost certainly harmful product because it's something that um 
impacts your specific marginalizations, um, something that you have to come to from your lived experience, and you're already anticipating having to communicate this thing that has probably been invalidated at you again and again and again and again and again. And how do you, if, if somebody came to you tomorrow and said, I want to be a sensitivity reader, I have somebody who has proposed a project to me, how do I take care of myself? Oh, wow. Oh. How do I, what, what, what do I need to ask for from this author? How do I take care of myself while I'm doing this project? What can uh, my community do? Yeah, get a really good community. Get your own very good supportive community because you need to unload some of that stuff. And it's not always the marginalizations that you experience. Look, I'll give you an example. Recently, I read um, a short story from somebody from a writer, white Australian woman writer, um, who was writing about an African-American woman and used uh, the dialogue was language that was lifted out of like gone with the wind or something equally oh. appalling and while I don't Some straight up Mark that, Twain right <laughs> yeah and while I don't share the same marginalizations I still walked away from that going oh this is a lot I can't you know if that's what she's writing like this to me and I'm reading this and she thinks it's okay for that what the hell so you really need your own community that you can then just uh, offload that stuff to and, and discuss it with and get some strategies and tips and just somebody to say, yeah. That was messed understand. up. Yeah. That was messed up. Completely understand. Go take a minute. You know, go do some stuff before you fall apart. Have someone you trust with your to dump out on who can keep that confidentiality so that it's not going to bounce back on you but there's a reason why sensitivity readers burn out there's a reason why the sensitivity readers um spreadsheet got taken down because people oh, yeah. were being attacked um yeah i remember that fun. that was a really wonderful resource to to have and access to and it's it really a deep. shame yeah Mm -hmm. And also, I have had many, many writers tell me they have to make their villain say terrible things so that people know they're the villain. That is the most ridiculous. It's a failure of imagination, right? Low effort <laughs> writing ever. And when it's directed in ways that are re-traumatizing already vulnerable people, I have no kind words to say about writers who think that that's the right way to go. Uh, yes. It's 2022. I'm tired of it. Yes. Your I character think, does not need to drop end bombs. No, they don't. I think yeah. like for me, I write a lot of things that are probably on the outer edges of what people think are okay. And I'm very well aware of this. I think that a lot of my characters do a lot of very bad, terrible, they're awful people. But I think that for me in creating those type of things, I had to create an awareness for myself and understand the actual reasons. You don't just drop the in bomb because you're an a-hole. I mean, that it's just not that simple. Right, and, like if you're gonna put it in, put it in with a purpose. Right, like give me, if you're going to, if you're going to write this guy, this terrible, we'll call him super Trumper guy, and he's the guy that runs up on people and yells at them about masks and whatnot, you can't only rely on this kind of, you know, outlandish behavior. I think that if that's what you're relying on, then you haven't really gotten to the meat of what you're trying to do. And I think that for a lot of writers, especially as maybe they're starting out to write fiction, that can be really difficult. And I think that it's important to go with it with the understanding that just putting bad things in a book does not necessarily reflect the badness of your character or why they're bad. And I think sometimes people misunderstand the difference between demonstrating badness and sort of getting into the meat of why it's bad. And if that's mm. what you're doing, you're writing a very two-dimensional character. So who's your narrator and what does your narrator think of that word? Mm. What does your narrator think of that behavior? Why did you choose that narrator and not a different narrator? What are the choices you made that led to the point where you were writing a character that drops end bombs? 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And really, what does that say about you as a person that that's your line to villainy? Because marginalized yeah. people will tell you that it's not the people dropping end bombs that are really the ones who are persistently, consistently the, the stress point. You don't have to say those words to be a terrible person. I think I've referred to it in editing as like the after school special villain where you have a bad guy. So they're going to do every bad thing. They're going to sexually assault every person they come across. They are going to drop the N bomb. They are going to kick puppies. They are the bad guy who is bad and they're not bad for a reason. They're just the bad guy who's bad and they have, they have to do all these things or the people won't understand that they're bad. And I, I think that doesn't give the reader enough credit for understanding what badness is. Actual historical people don't work like that. Yeah. Yeah. Actual historical baddies have lovely families and children and all of that. So, you know, write three dimensional characters. What's that if you're actually paid oh. to write two dimensional characters, then, you know. <laughs> Congratulations. You Enjoy that Hallmark some, money. <laughs> maybe you can still bring some new ones into there. I don't know. It's probably me dreaming too big. <laughs> All right. We are we are getting right on to the end of time. So I want to just check through and make sure that I have gotten to all of the questions that everybody sent in. Um, I think so. Um, there's a, somebody asked a question actually about like, are there people who hold themselves out as sensitivity readers that are absolutely not qualified to do that? And and if so, how do you spot them? And I have a personal example of, of someone that a client of mine hired to work on a, a specific project. And they were actually coming to this project after having done similar work for a group that is now generally recognized as a hate group. Um, and, um, but you know, <laughs> they were like, well, I've, I've done all of this work on all of these marginalizations. And it was just like, it was kind of a wow moment when we, when we looked up the work that they had actually done. Um, so, so how do you, how do you spot that? I mean, Shannon we don't said it research. Yeah. Yeah. We don't want to make any assumptions yeah. about somebody's marginalizations based on the way they look or, you know, how they experience the world, but at the same time, <laughs> Well, you know and it's yeah. Don't, do not look for the lightest complected person, the most privileged person of that marginalization to be your sensitivity reader, unless you are actually talking about somebody of that, that caste, that class, that, that colorist privilege. Because I guarantee you, if you select somebody just because they ticked off the boxes, they're not going to get to what it's like for a character with more marginalization than they experience. Mm -hmm. So yeah. and ask questions, like it's possible to, to speak to a sensitivity reader and say, what experience do you have in this community? What are your marginalizations? Do you understand the character that I'm trying to write? But those are all legitimate questions and perfectly fine to ask. And a lot of sensitivity readers are writers. So I think that it's worth it look at their work, look at how yeah. they talk to other people, look at, I mean, I think a good example sometimes is, you know, lurk their Twitter, because a yeah. lot of people let it all hang out on Twitter. So, you know, if, yeah. if you have kind of that feeling that you need to know, just, and I know it can be a little bit creepy, but I think that it's worth it to take your time, check people out, you know, get into that Google deep dive and make sure that that person is involved with work or their work as their own creator is something that you'd want to say yes i want to stand in community with this person and look yes. to them and say this was my mentor for this or this is the person who helped me get through this part of my work this you know if you want to be the person that says this is the person you know, that's the person for you. I think that it's very easy to, you know, have maybe gone to the spreadsheet that we used to have and say, oh, I like that name, that person, you know, 
you're probably not going to get as good of an experience as you could have. I think for, you know, for me, the other part of it is when someone tells me, hey, I read your work. I read this thing that you said. You said this. I really resonate with that. I would really like to work with you. Um, in addition to that, I, I, when I'm looking for somebody to be in dialogue with about a character that I've written, I will actually look at how they speak up in solidarity for other marginalized groups because it tells me a lot about their positioning and what they are for and against. And maybe I actually need somebody who's very conservative and has certain kinds of ideas and to, to vet to make sure that I've gotten that correctly. But for the most part, for the kinds of things I'm looking at, I am actually looking at how do they talk about marginalizations that are not the one that I am specifically asking them for, but are they in solidarity? And also because this is about writing, it's totally legit to say, hey, you know, what are some of your favorite authors in the genre? What do you like reading? What would you recommend that I read? The things that they say in those moments are going to tell you a lot of things about who they are. Yeah. And if they, yeah. they, if they told you to go read, you know, famous turfy writer, it, it's going to tell you a lot. Yeah, I just want to add on to what Kat was saying is that particularly when you're living in a settler colonial society and you're asking people of a marginalization that is not necessarily indigenous, you want to make sure that they're across all of those issues as well. Because quite a lot of us have a lot of privilege that indigenous folks do not have. And if we're not speaking up for those issues as well, you might want to just have a think about whether that's a person you want to employ. Yeah, in general. And since we are at the end of our time, uh, if somebody wanted to employ one of you, <laughs> um, <laughs> I, you know, shameless plug, feel free to shamelessly plug yourself or just say you're not taking projects at this time. But uh, but anybody who wants to, please, um, I will be happy to drop your socials or contact information into our channels and, and make sure folks know where to find you. Yeah, you've got all, all right. my socials, you can contact me. I'm available. All right. Thank you so, so much. I am going to stop recording now and good night. Thank you all for coming. And I'm so glad we were able to find a time that worked for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Bye.